This is In The Fast Lane, live from the Australian Grand Prix, with your hosts, Matt Clayton and Michael Laminato. And we are live within the Fast Lane, the official podcast of the Australian Grand Prix, as we count down to the 2022 Formula One Heineken Australian Grand Prix at Albert Park on Sunday. I'm your host, Matt Clayton, and coming up a little later on this hour, we'll be chatting to some of the heaviest hitters in the F1 paddock, the team principals. Joining us up on stage will be McLaren's Andreas Seidel, Alfa Romeo's Frederick Vasseur, and from Haas, Gunter Steiner. But we've just had opening practice for the first time at Albert Park in three years. It feels really good to say that. And it's a very look different looking Albert Park, mind you. But joining me in the host chair, as he does for every episode of In the Fast Lane, is F1 journalist Michael Laminato. Michael, welcome. It's good to be back, isn't it? I'm ashamed I wasn't on the heavy hitter list, but I'll cop that from you today. Moderate hitter, I think Mo we'll call you. Moderate hitter. I'll take that. Yes, what a great day for it as well. So many people here. How, know, is, how is this Friday? This is crazy. Yes, certainly very different to the last Friday we had here. Many, very, many more people here than the last Friday <laughs> oh. we had here. But it is superb to see, and the cars in action on yep. a brand new track. It doesn't get much better. Brand new cars on a brand new track, and already we are faster than the pole position time here mm. in 2019, the last time we raced here. So Ferrari's Carlos Sainz led the first official on-track session at Albert Park for three years. His lap a 119.806, about six-tenths of a second quicker than Lewis Hamilton's pole time back in 2019. But looking at the timesheets from FP1, we've got a very clear picture in that we've got Ferrari and Red Bull in this tier at the top, and then everyone else in some varying order afterwards. But... You were out at the circuit. You went out to the uh, the cool chicane, I believe, as Oscar <laughs> Piastri referred to it yesterday yes. at what is now turns 9 and 10. I think the approach to that corner now is at around 3.20 or so k's an hour. How was it from Drake's side? It was really fast. That's a pretty obvious <laughs> remark, I think, considering this year. What always shocks me about that, and it's, I think it's going to be really interesting as this weekend goes on, is it is a DRS zone. It's extremely quick, as you said. It's so not straight. Like, yeah. it is so <laughs> yeah. not straight going into that corner. We saw a couple of close calls already yes. running into that braking zone. I can only see that. I mean, imagine qualifying Q1 when you've got cars trying to sort out their laps. That's going to be a real pressure point. And I'm really interested to see how it's going to go in the race as well because it's a, it's a real braking zone now. You know, it used to be sort of on the cusp of flat. Now it's a challenging corner. And that whole back section is a real challenge. With DRS open, it's going to be difficult for grip as well. Really interesting addition to the track. Yeah, I think so. I think it completely changes the characteristics of the second and third sector of the lap, both in terms of how it'll race with that fourth DRS zone. But I think, as you said, traffic in qualifying and getting a lap right, DRS open across the back here, that's going to be a little sketchy, isn't it? I'm worried just thinking about it. I'm not going out there during qualifying. I'm staying inside of qualifying. It is. And we've already seen so many, not only on that part of the track as well, the back section of the track is different. And it's just catching drivers out a little bit. The surface is also new, so that's having an influence. There's still a lot of learning to be done over the course of today and the first half of tomorrow. So, look, quite a big gap at the front. Carlos Sainz was uh, over five tenths of a second quicker than his teammate Charles Leclerc. Leclerc had a bit of an off on his fastest lap towards the end of the session there. The Red Bull duo three and four, but Sergio Perez in front of Max Verstappen, not something we say particularly mm. often. What's interesting, after those first four, Lando Norris, P5 for McLaren, he's over a second adrift. So it does definitely give you these two classes of Formula One in this early part of the season. Also rounding out the top ten, Esteban Ocon in P6 for Alpine. Lewis Hamilton, the fastest of the Mercedes, seventh. Daniel Ricciardo, eighth for mm. McLaren. So a much more promising showing for McLaren after what we've seen in the first couple of races. We'll talk to Andreas Seidel about that shortly. Rounding out the top ten, Fernando Alonso for Alpine. Valtteri Bottas for Alfa Romeo. Of course, the reigning Australian Grand Prix yeah. winner. The <laughs> longest reign in Australian Grand Prix history of three years. But of that second tier, we don't seem to know on a weekend-to-weekend -weekend basis at the moment who is the top of this second tier because it's a long second tier. There's a couple of teams off the back. We'll get to those. What did you see in that first session that might be indicative of the order for the rest of the weekend? And are we reading too much into it to be optimistic about McLaren? Because that was a lot better than probably I was expecting. Yeah, I didn't expect to see both in the top 10. I'm sure it was a pleasant surprise considering the number of orange caps out here that McLaren looked pretty good in mm. FP1. But it is FP1, isn't it? And that Don't is a big ass to keep your bootlaces tied up. Don't take those <laughs> shoes off. No, it's too early in the weekend for that. It's, uh, look, it could be promising. It's a circuit that's likely to suit them a little bit better, certainly than Bahrain, which was terrible. Yes. A little bit more in the Saudi vein of things, as dramatically different as that track is to this one. So I do think that they'll be in contention for points at least. And that's sort of 
Well, you can almost say for any midfield team, to be fair, though, isn't it? Considering we know that the top four is pretty much blocked out. Yep. Top six, in fact, including Mercedes, although they didn't look so competitive here. But I kind of put them to one side in practice because there's a lot of experimentation still going on at Mercedes. You don't really know what they're capable of till qualifying. It's always going to be tight for points. So if McLaren's going to be in the mix, they're going to be in the mix with Alpine and with Alfa Romeo because they, for me, are at the head of the midfield at the moment. Are Mercedes in the midfield, or are they in their own sort of class of one as not as quick as mm. Ferrari and Red Bull, but better than the others? I'm only saying this in the context of Saudi Arabia. If this track is more Saudi Arabia than Bahrain, and it's a bizarre concept, but you can get your head around that. <laughs> Mercedes were nowhere in Saudi Arabia. I think Hamilton was 73 seconds off the oh, win at the yeah. end of that race and had to ask if you got a point for finishing 10th. Mm. So are we sure that Mercedes are there or thereabouts? Because, you know, again, we haven't had a, a day race since about last yes, October, so true. that's another factor to throw in here. Where are they? Because they still look like they're in a bit of no man's land to me. Well, they're in purgatory, aren't they? They're purgatory. not among the front runners, and nor are they among the midfielders. That's what it looks like anyway. If you're a Mercedes fan, you can take heart, I guess, from the fact that George Russell in Saudi Arabia, again, to, to refer to it, 20 seconds behind everyone yeah. and then ahead of the midfield. Like, that's just no man's land. There's nothing there. And it's, it's difficult to believe that this will be such a different track that they will fall into the midfield or become front runners without yeah. significant upgrades. So I think all things being equal, that is where they've got to be. If they're not in that bracket, then something's gone wrong. Like Saudi for, for Lewis Hamilton, something went wrong for him. That's what they're looking at here. So you're really looking at the top six being locked out, but you definitely know who's going to be fifth and sixth if they do the job right. Let's run through the back end of the field here. 11th, Yuki Tsunoda, his first laps of this circuit. Pretty daunting one mm. after you didn't even do a lap in Saudi Arabia and last time. And his engine made it. For once, his, his, his engine, engine made it to the end of a session. It. George Russell, P12 for Mercedes. Sebastian Vettel, 13th. Pierre Gasly, 14th. Zhou Guan Yu, another first-timer at Albert Park, 15th. But uh, you mentioned bad news before. Sebastian Vettel completed his flying lap of the circuit on a scooter. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's an incredible thing to consider, isn't it? He, look, he's coming back. This is his first race of the year. Maybe his engine thinks it's the first race as well. The reliability is going to be problematic for, for uh, Sebastian Vettel. It didn't sound promising, did it? The way he was talking about it as well, that it's gone. There's smoke from the back. It's not good. Mm. It's not good for Aston Martin as well, a team that was already considering, or we, they were already considering being at the very back of the grid with Williams, most likely. He just... Look, I don't want to say he seems unhappy here because he doesn't. He loves racing in Formula 1. That's why he's here. But, you know, he's, he's probably not having a good time, I think it's fair to say at the moment, is he? No. I love the uh, use of no good. Also, about no good <laughs> is about how our tape's going on our signage <laughs> up the front here. But it's a good thing this is an audio podcast. Made a satisfying but, uh, sound, though, yeah, didn't it? <laughs> indeed. Let's round out the rest of the field here. Lance Stroll, 16th for Aston Martin. Alex Albon, Kevin Magnussen, Nicholas Latifi and Mick Schumacher. Tricky morning for Haas. Magnussen's not been well overnight. But, uh, sounds like he might have uh, had a bit of dodgy something to eat last night for dinner, so he was no good. And uh, <laughs> Mick Schumacher's best lap on the soft tyre was ruined by one of the red flags, so that's probably why he's back there. But uh, interesting with Haas, when we'll talk to Gunter Steiner about this a little bit later on, they've been very, very good. And you look at Saudi Arabia. We had Kevin Magnussen on last week's podcast. He was mildly disappointed yeah. to finish ninth. And also, very matter-of-fact, it's like, well, I beat Hamilton, but he was slow anyway. Yeah. And it's like, is this the same Formula 1 we watched last year? A team that didn't <laughs> score a point, just expecting to beat the team that basically won the championship? Like, what, what's going on? Yeah, I mean, if you said Kevin Magnussen, a regular point scorer this time last year, you wouldn't know what was going on, would you? Clearly unrepresentative from them. Uh, you know, more than three seconds off even Kevin Magnussen was, which is, we know not where the car belongs. A difficult morning for him as well. It's difficult to say how unwell he might still be. You always have to take a sharp inhalation, don't you, when anyone's sick these days, but it's not that disease, which is good to know, which means he continues to race, hopefully. And we know there's more to come from that car. The Williams car there, I think, is more questionable because they were off the pace, and we know that they're generally a little bit off the pace this yep. season, aren't yep. they? So it's still unclear. It is FP1 at a new track, which means you can never really get a clear picture at the end of the day, can you? You really don't know where these teams are yet. We'll get much better a picture in only a couple of hours' time. Should we be treating this as a brand new track? I know it's the 25th race here. Mm. The layout, it's the first time it's changed, really, in that 25 years. And not just a little bit. We know that there's a couple of corners been removed. The lap times will probably end up being about five seconds quicker than we've ever seen. Is this basically a new circuit at this point? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I don't think we can say, like, a track record has been broken. Because when you've removed two whole corners, it's not really the same track, is it? Combined with the fact some corners are quicker, they've been tweaked, some quite substantially, turn six we've talked about before, which is yep. nearly eight metres wider. 
that's pretty much a whole new corner. It means this isn't, yeah, really the Albert Park we've become used to. And really more to the point, all those changes combined means for the teams, the setup challenge is really different. Like they've got to learn how they've got to change the downforce setup for this track. It used to be higher, now it is lower. It is really a completely new challenge, which is why I do suspect the order will change quite substantially by the time we get to qualifying. Well, look, Michael, we're going to take a short break here, but coming up on the other side, we'll be chatting to McLaren's team principal, Andreas Seidel. If you're listening to us here on In The Fast Lane, you obviously love F1 and have a great taste in podcasts. Have you heard F1 Beyond The Grid? It's the podcast where you'll truly get to know the biggest names in F1. It's hosted by F1 journalist Tom Clarkson. Recent guests include 1992 world champion Nigel Mansell, Susie Wolf, and Ferrari's Carlos Sainz. Every week on F1 Beyond the Grid, a superstar driver, big boss, or brilliant brain from the world of F1 opens up about the highs and lows of their racing careers and their lives off track. You'll hear stories you've never heard before and insight you won't hear anywhere else. There are more than 150 episodes in the back catalogue. In-depth interviews with Daniel Ricciardo, Lando Norris, Mark Webber, Sebastian Vettel, Kimi Raikkonen, Lewis Hamilton and many more. Why not give it a listen right here at Albert Park in the gaps between sessions? It's also perfect for your journey to work, while out walking or your flight home from the Australian Grand Prix. You can find F1 Beyond the Grid on Apple, Spotify and all other major podcast apps. It's also available on F1's YouTube channel. So once you've finished listening to us, search for F1 Beyond Sunburn. the Grid. It might just become your second favourite Formula One podcast, after In the Fast Lane, of course. <laughs> Time for a bit of F1 trivia. Did you know the Australian Grand Prix was once held twice in a row and that the same driver won both races? In 1995, the Australian Grand Prix was the final race of the season. It was held in Adelaide. In 1996, the Australian Grand Prix was the first race of the season, held right here in Melbourne. The same driver won both. It was Damon Hill. So Damon Hill won two consecutive Australian Grand Prix, back to back, just 119 days apart. I mentioned Damon Hill because he's one of the hosts of the F1 Nation podcast, which you should definitely check out. It's hosted by Damon with F1 reporters Tom Clarkson and Natalie Pinkham. They chat to a whole host of F1 guests from around the world, drivers, team bosses and paddock insiders. The next episode will be out this Tuesday. They'll have the last word on what we hope will be a thrilling Australian Grand Prix here at Albert Park. Search for F1 Nation on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all major podcast apps or F1's YouTube channel. Check out In The Fast Lane, the official podcast of the Australian Grand Prix. Dedicated to Formula One and MotoGP, In The Fast Lane host Matt Clayton is joined by F1 journalist Michael Laminato and MotoGP race winner Chris Vermeulen to interview some of the biggest names in world motorsport and update you on all the latest F1 and MotoGP racing news and talking points. You can find In The Fast Lane each week on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. This is In The Fast Lane, the official podcast of the Australian Grand Prix, live from Melbourne Park, with Matt Clayton and Michael Laminato. And joining us on stage is McLaren Team Principal, Andreas Seidel. Andreas, welcome back to Melbourne. Wow, I have to say. So great to be back, uh, guys. Uh, so good to see all the papaya hats and shirts. Um, we were looking forward to come back uh, after what we experienced here in 20 and to come back here this year with Daniel. Very, very special. And Thanks for having us here, guys. Well, and to remind you, too, this is Friday. This is crazy. <laughs> the race is in two days. It was already crazy yesterday, yeah, I have to say. It Normally was. on a Thursday, it's very, very quiet at these racetracks where we go. But to see the atmosphere that you guys created already yesterday here for us was uh, very special. So, big thanks. Mm. I can't help but wonder how many people have told their bosses they're working from home today. Oh, yeah, like how many yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm on a Zoom call. I'm working yeah, from home. It's yeah, hybrid exactly. work. Yeah, it's exactly. fine. Andreas, short question with a longer answer. Reasonably competitive FP1 for you guys. How did you see it? Yeah, no, definitely. Had a good start into this weekend. Um, P5 and P8. Uh, both drivers were doing well. So I think the team also did a great job in order to start straight away on the right foot here at this track. At the same time, still early days, but the goal is clear. We want to score solid points with both cars and uh, important to have a, a good start. Andreas, tell me about the, the mood in the team after the first two races. Obviously, it was pretty optimistic during pre-season, the end of last year. Two very difficult races to start the season. What's it been like back at base recovering from those ahead of this race? 
Yeah, we definitely um, started the season uh, not where we wanted to start it. We had some issues at the final test in Bahrain before heading into the race weekend, which put us a bit on the, on the back foot. Uh, so the difficult weekend we, we experienced then in, in Bahrain as expected, but in China was already a good step forward. Both cars were, uh, yeah, in the in the fight for, for good points. Unfortunately, we had a, a technical issue then on Daniel's car after a strong race from his side. Um, yeah, we just need to keep fighting. Uh, it is clear um, we have some work to do, but the entire team is fully committed in order to give uh, Daniel and Lando a quicker car again as quickly as possible. And I'm quite optimistic with the team we have in place with Lando and Daniel. Uh, it's just a matter of time to be back where we want to be. That's uh, something this crowd's definitely going to look forward to, Andreas. But I was curious with Bahrain, was that more a product of spe uh, specific, uh, the track layout and the temperature? Or because Saudi looked better, but that's obviously a very, very different layout to Bahrain. How do you see what happened in Saudi in terms of the car pace translating to this track? Because this track is now a very different track to the Albert Park that McLaren has come to in the past. Yeah, as I explained uh, my last answer, I think we had two issues in Bahrain. First of all, we were on the back foot with... Uh, challenging test we had, so we just didn't have enough experience on how to get all the performance out of the, the package, out of the car, how it was. At the same time, I think the track layout in Bahrain, the low speed corners, uh, doesn't suit our car that much. And then in, in Saudi, in Jeddah, with more experience uh, with the car, with the track layout, which was a bit more fluent. Uh, I think that's these two things were the reason then why we could make a step already. And now we simply have to make the next steps. We were talking just before you arrived about the new layout here. It is a little bit faster. Hopefully that does mean, as you said, you can aim for, for pretty good points. The approach to this track, though, how different is it compared to how the team would have to have approached it in 2019, the old layout? Is it dramatically different the way you're going to have to set up the cars and tackle it? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the new nature of the track definitely has an influence on the on the ideal setup of the car. But as always, we get some good uh, track data in advance, uh, which we then uh, use for all our simulations and simulator work with the drivers uh, before coming here. And as I said before, if I look at how the first session went, the team has done a great job in preparing together with Lando and Daniel. Now we just need to make sure we keep it up for the rest of the weekend. Let's talk about Daniel. Obviously, his struggles last year to really make things fit at McLaren has been, has been well documented, obviously with that massive high point of the win at Monza. Did you, I mean, obviously you were very keen to get Daniel here. There was a relationship there. But what did you discover about him last year? Because often you discover things about people when they're at their lowest moments. Did Daniel reveal anything to you last year in terms of his character and the way he goes racing that has you more optimistic that there are much better times to come for him? Yeah, I mean, there was one clear reason uh, why I wanted to get Daniel on board. First of all, because... Oh, it's two reasons. Three reasons. Three reasons. <laughs> First of all, keep, keep I worked on. a lot with Mark Webber in the past. Well, so yes. it, so you, you when he stopped his career, it was clear I need an Aussie again in, the, yeah, yeah. In, in, in my team. Just to have a bit of fun as well, uh, which is important. But then we wanted to get Daniel on board because he has shown in the past with the right car, he can win races. Um, and that was something that uh, we were missing in the team as a, as a reference in the, in the years before. And... Uh, yeah, as always, it's not easy. Formula One is complex. And to change team from one year to the next with a limited testing team also uh, time we had last year, it was a, a challenge for him to get used to the car at the beginning of the season. But then second half of the season, um, I wouldn't talk about any struggles he had. I mean, he had a strong second half of the season with us. He pulled off some great races and qualifyings. The great win for us, the first win again for McLaren since 2012. And uh, yeah, now it's simply important in the second season with us to keep building on on that momentum he had in the second half of the season. Um, he had a good race weekend already in Cheddar after his COVID infection in Bahrain, which put him a, back on, a bit on the back foot as well. And uh, yeah, we just have to keep going and I'm sure we can celebrate together with our fans, with his fans, a lot more success in the next years with him. Tell me about Lando Norris. Obviously, he took an enormous step forward last season, really felt like he arrived in Formula One. Obviously, you and the team as well, uh, Lando and the team, I beg your pardon, really fit together well. You've extended contracts twice down the last two years. How happy is he at McLaren? Why does it suit him so well, McLaren and Lando Norris? Well, I think, um, first of all, from our point of view, I obviously need two quick drivers in order to be competitive in the Constructors' Championship and be in a good position at each race to, to score great results. Therefore, I'm very happy with having Lando and Daniel on board. 
And on Lando's side, he started his Formula One career uh, with McLaren. Uh, he's going into his fourth year of, of Formula One now, and obviously he wants to be part of that journey. Uh, because a lot of what we have in place now, he was part of uh, building it. And if you look at the, the results that we could score the last three years, uh, yeah, a lot of points were coming from him. And it's just impressive how these young guys enter Formula One and make then these steps in these first years. Impressive steps. And uh, as I said before, um, looking forward to now have uh, yeah, many more years together with Lando and Daniel in order to keep building it up and uh, in order to close this gap to the front in the next years and fight more often again for podium finishes and uh, race wins, hopefully. A couple more, Andreas, before we let you go. You mentioned your association with Mark Webber back with the, the BMW Williams days. I'm, I'm assuming that you are very fluent in Australian at this point. You just add a comma and mate at the end of every <laughs> sentence, and that's pretty much Mark's commentary over the radio. But you've obviously been coming to this race and Melbourne now for, for some years, with, with a gap in, obviously, when you were back in uh, doing the WEC stuff. Tell us about this city, and for the people that maybe haven't necessarily travelled to many other Grand Prix around the world, what is it that makes Melbourne a Grand Prix city that everyone enjoys coming to? Yeah, I think if you just look out here, uh, it tells you why it is so special to come in here. This, the, the atmosphere you guys are creating here uh, for us teams coming here, the whole atmosphere the city is also creating is very, very special, and I can assure you that every single member of the team each year is looking forward to come here, have a good time. And uh, obviously, hopefully, we put up a great show again uh, for all our fans, for all the F1 fans in, in general. Um, and uh, yeah, and then yeah, just looking forward each year to come back again and again and again. And as I, as I said before, for us, having an Australian driver with Daniel uh, makes it even more special. And that's why I just hope we can uh, score a great result at the weekend for all our Papaya fans. And one before we let you go. There's huge support for Formula One. It feels like in an increasing number of places in the last year or two. So much so that team principals are getting rounds of applause. People recognise you in the street, presumably. Is this the, the biggest moment for Formula One you felt you know, this year or the last couple of years? And why does it seem like it's at such a popular point in time? Um, there's for sure different reasons, but I can tell you just from a team perspective, it's, it's just great to be part of a team uh, in these days in Formula One because the momentum Formula One is having at the moment, uh, seeing the increase of number of fans as well worldwide, it's just, it's just crazy. And uh, obviously the great show I think we have seen also in the last years in terms of the battle at the front, but also in the, in the midfield. The crazy start we have seen also into this year with these new regulations is just obviously helping. There's things happening like Drive to Survive that gave the fans a lot of access also to actually see behind the scenes what's going on in Formula One. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to simply keep going like that with Formula One. Yeah, look, things are certainly on the right trajectory at the moment. Andreas, we really appreciate your time here today to come up on stage and chat to all the fans here. Thanks for joining us on the podcast and all the best for the rest of the weekend. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for all the support, Papaya fans. Cheers. We're going to take a short break, but when we come back, joining us here on In The Fast Lane Live will be Alfa Romeo team principal, Frederick Vasseur. Time for a bit of F1 trivia. Did you know the Australian Grand Prix was once held twice in a row and that the same driver won both races? In 1995, the Australian Grand Prix was the final race of the season. It was held in Adelaide. In 1996, the Australian Grand Prix was the first race of the season, held right here in Melbourne. The same driver won both. It was Damon Hill. So Damon Hill won two consecutive Australian Grand Prix, back to back, just 119 days apart. I mentioned Damon Hill because he's one of the hosts of the F1 Nation podcast, which you should definitely check out. It's hosted by Damon with F1 reporters Tom Clarkson and Natalie Pinkham. They chat to a whole host of F1 guests from around the world, drivers, team bosses and paddock insiders. The next episode will be out this Tuesday. They'll have the last word on what we hope will be a thrilling Australian Grand Prix here at Albert Park. Search for F1 Nation on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all major podcast apps or F1's YouTube channel. If you're listening to us here on In The Fast Lane, you obviously love F1 and have a great taste in podcasts. Have you heard F1 Beyond The Grid? It's the podcast where you'll truly get to know the biggest names in F1. It's hosted by F1 journalist Tom Clarkson. Recent guests include 1992 world champion Nigel Mansell, Susie Wolfe and Ferrari's Carlos Sainz. 
Every week on F1 Beyond the Grid, a superstar driver, big boss or brilliant brain from the world of F1 opens up about the highs and lows of their racing careers and their lives off track. You'll hear stories you've never heard before and insight you won't hear anywhere else. There are more than 150 episodes in the back catalogue. In-depth interviews with Daniel Ricciardo, Lando Norris, Mark Webber, Sebastian Vettel, Kimi Raikkonen, Lewis Hamilton and many more. Why not give it a listen right here at Albert Park in the gaps between sessions? It's also perfect for your journey to work, while out walking, or your flight home from the Australian Grand Prix. You can find F1 Beyond the Grid on Apple, Spotify, and all other major podcast apps. It's also available on F1's YouTube channel. So once you've finished listening to us, search for F1 Beyond the Grid. It might just become your second favourite Formula One podcast, after In the Fast Lane, of course. Check out In the Fast Lane, the official podcast of the Australian Grand Prix. Dedicated to Formula One and MotoGP, In the Fast Lane host Matt Clayton is joined by F1 journalist Michael Laminato and MotoGP race winner Chris Vermeulen to interview some of the biggest names in world motorsport and update you on all the latest F1 and MotoGP racing news and talking points. You can find In the Fast Lane each week on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. This is In The Fast Lane, the official podcast of the Australian Grand Prix, live from Melbourne Park, with Matt Clayton and Michael Laminato. And we are back live with In The Fast Lane, live at the Albert Park Grand Prix circuit. Very happy to be joined by Alfa Romeo team principal, Frederick Messer. Frederick, welcome. Hello. Frederick, we just had our first practice session at Albert Park for three years. These fans have been waiting a long time to see these cars back in action. How was the first session for your team? Because you've obviously got the uh, the reigning Australian Grand Prix winner driving for you this year. Yeah, it was not too bad. At first, we had a good start of the season on the first two events, and this morning went pretty well. Uh, the modification on track are quite important, and it's a big change for everybody. But we just have to set up everything and to be ready for the rest of the weekend. But I think also that we'll have a, a big track improvement over the weekend. It's not a permanent circuit. And let's see what's happened. Tell me about the, the start of this season. You've almost already outscored your score point from last year, just in the first uh, We two can races. stop now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a big upswing. I think people are pretty pleased to see Alfa Romeo performing really strongly. How did that match your expectations in pre-season testing? And how has the outlook for your result at the end of the season changed? Uh, first pre-season testing was a nightmare. We had yeah. too many issues on reliability, and it was very difficult for us to know exactly where we stand. But we had good expectation because the numbers were good into the wind tunnel, but we didn't know exactly where the others were. And it was, I would say, a good surprise when we arrived in Bahrain, the first session, that uh, I, uh, when you are running in the winter, you don't know what the level of fuel, the engine, and so. But at least in quality, everybody is running with low fuel and max power. And, he, and we went there. And uh, it was quite similar in Jeddah that the pace was there over the weekend, even if we didn't score point for reliability issue. But at the end, of, at the end of the day, I think the weekend was OK. Now we have just to, to stay there and to continue to push because I think everybody will develop and it will be the challenge. Obviously, a massive regulation reset for this year, probably the biggest one we've had in 40 years, really, if you're going back to ground effect. A lot of teams retained driver lineups or made very subtle tweaks around the edges. Your team's got two new drivers this year. Is that a case of maybe a little short-term pain in terms of getting drivers accustomed to the team and getting the new car right. Was that worth it for the longer term? Because you're the only team that's gone down that path. Is that part of the thinking? Uh, you, in one end, you can say that drivers will take more importance in the future with the convergence of performance. Mm -hmm. I think that all the teams, that the, the new regulation is like this, and with all the teams will converge to an, uh, an optimum. And in this situation, the, the driver it's himself will take more place into the results. On our side, that we, we decided to change completely the lineup. It was probably a bit risky on some points because to start from, not from scratch, but to start with a, a new one, it's, it's not dangerous, but you are losing somehow the, the ground. But with Valtteri, we had also someone coming from Mercedes with a mega huge experience of the top team with something like 10 years in F1 or a bit more. And it was not, a, uh, I assume the risk in this case, that <laughs> was the good one. And, and honestly, that the other point is that Joe is doing a very good job, that uh, so far he didn't make any mistake on track. He did good, good overtakings, that uh, he suffered two times on the start, not for the same reason, 
Bahrain, we had a poor start, and uh, Jeddah, we had a contact, but after this, he was able to come back with good fight that uh, in the radio he was almost crying when he overtook Lewis on the first race. <laughs> that <laughs> was a good move and, uh, and I really enjoyed the collaboration. Tell me about how Valtteri settled into the team. It looks like he settled very well, judging by his results so far. What does he bring to the team? As you said, 10 years experience with a race winning team, he's a race winner. What do you expect from him when you sign someone like that? I, I know him for years now that uh, we race together in the junior series. And I was convinced that for Valtteri, it will be a good step forward, not in terms of performance. I don't want to compare Alfa Romeo and Mercedes today. It's not the, 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 the issue. But in terms of positioning into the team, that uh, it was crystal clear into the discussion that he has to take a, a role of leader into the whole team when he was a little bit always in the shadow of, of Lewis at Mercedes. And I think it was also the challenge for Valtteri he was ready for this, and I think he's doing, at least on this point, and it's true also for the race, but on this point, he's doing a very good job. With Zhou Guan Yu, obviously, first Chinese full-time driver in Formula One, you obviously knew that was going to be a massive story in a certain part of the world, but has the level of interest and just the sheer attention that's been placed on this team, is that almost a surprise? Because it's still, it still can, you can underestimate that, can't you, with a country as big as that? Yeah, it's never easy because that's, we are not starting from scratch in, the, in this part of the world, but almost. And I think it's not just the interest on, on Joe, it's also the interest on the F1. And I think that if we are able to, to succeed on this, I think it will be a, a good push, not only for the team, but for the F1. It's easy to say when you've got a very experienced driver and a rookie driver, well, of course, the experienced guy is going to be helping him out somehow, some kind of paternal relationship almost. But the first guy they want to beat is the other guy, their teammate, right? That's the bar. Is there any management required from your perspective to ensure that that relationship works well? That they don't have, feel like they need to hide things from one another or anything like that? No, so far it's working very well. That, uh, uh, and we have a, a huge difference in terms of experience, not in terms of pace, because Joe is doing a very good job. But in terms of experience, it's obvious that the, the delta is mega. But where you are completely right is that as soon as the, <laughs> the rookie will be yeah. closer and closer to the other, that <laughs> we will start the issue. <laughs> you, you might have a little management to do later on in the season, no, Frederick, perhaps. I can but... speak like a book and to say we yeah. <laughs> would, would be perfect, but this is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, look, before we let you go, one final one. We mentioned off the top that you've almost overtaken last season's points already. What constitutes a good weekend for Alfa Romeo in Australia? Is it uh, two cars in the back end of the points or are you setting your sights a bit wow. higher? Clearly, if you have a look on the first two events, we were able to have a, one car in Q3, the other one in Q2, and to be in position to score points with two cars, and I think that we have to stick to the plan. Frederick, it's been great to talk to you this afternoon. Thanks for coming out for all the fans Thank here. You. Appreciate your time. Thank you. It's not the karaoke today. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take a short break and press pause on in the fast lane for a moment, but coming up next is Haas F1 team principal, Gunter Steiner. So stick around. <laughs> If you're listening to us here on In The Fast Lane, you obviously love F1 and have a great taste in podcasts. Have you heard F1 Beyond The Grid? It's a podcast where you'll truly get to know the biggest names in F1. It's hosted by F1 journalist Tom Clarkson. Recent guests include 1992 world champion Nigel Mansell, Susie Wolfe and Ferrari's Carlos Sainz. Every week on F1 Beyond The Grid, a superstar driver, big boss or brilliant brain from the world of F1 opens up about the highs and lows of their racing careers and their lives off track. You'll hear stories you've never heard before and insight you won't hear anywhere else. There are more than 150 episodes in the back catalogue. In-depth interviews with Daniel Ricciardo, Lando Norris, Mark Webber, Sebastian Vettel, Kimi Raikkonen, Lewis Hamilton and many more. Why not give it a listen right here at Elba Park in the gaps between sessions? It's also perfect for your journey to work, while out walking, or your flight home from the Australian Grand Prix. You can find F1 Beyond the Grid on Apple, Spotify and all other major podcast apps. It's also available on F1's YouTube channel. So once you've finished listening to us, search for F1 Beyond the Grid. It might just become your second favourite Formula One podcast, after In the Fast Lane, of course. Time for a bit of F1 trivia. Did you know the Australian Grand Prix was once held twice in a row and that the same driver won both races? 
In 1995, the Australian Grand Prix was the final race of the season. It was held in Adelaide. In 1996, the Australian Grand Prix was the first race of the season, held right here in Melbourne. The same driver won both. It was Damon Hill. So Damon Hill won two consecutive Australian Grand Prix, back to back, just 119 days apart. I mentioned Damon Hill because he's one of the hosts of the F1 Nation podcast, which you should definitely check out. It's hosted by Damon with F1 reporters Tom Clarkson and Natalie Pinkham. They chat to a whole host of F1 guests from around the world, drivers, team bosses and paddock insiders. The next episode will be out this Tuesday. They'll have the last word on what we hope will be a thrilling Australian Grand Prix here at Albert Park. Search for F1 Nation on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all major podcast apps or F1's YouTube channel. Check out In The Fast Lane, the official podcast of the Australian Grand Prix. Dedicated to Formula One and MotoGP, In The Fast Lane host Matt Clayton is joined by F1 journalist Michael Laminato and MotoGP race winner Chris Vermeulen to interview some of the biggest names in world motorsport and update you on all the latest F1 and MotoGP racing news and talking points. You can find In The Fast Lane each week on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. This is In The Fast Lane, the official podcast of the Australian Grand Prix, live from Albert Park, with Matt Clayton and Michael Laminato. And we are back within the Fast Lane, live here at Albert Park for the 2022 Formula One Heineken Australian Grand Prix. And Michael, we had Kevin Magnuson on as our last guest just after the race in Saudi. Having Kevin Magnuson on the Formula One grid in Melbourne in 2022 was not something I was expecting to say, but uh, he certainly made the most of an amazing career opportunity, hasn't he? Yeah, I mean, he wasn't expecting it either, <laughs> I, I, which I think is the best part of the story, really. He hadn't been home uh, before he went home to Saudi Arabia. When he left home, I should say, he didn't expect to be a Formula One driver. He went to the US as part of his sports car program, right. got the call, went to Bahrain, raced in Bahrain, raced in Saudi, then went home. Imagine walking through the front door and telling everybody we'd been for the last month. I'd yep. expect to be back for one week. It's an incredible turnaround for him. And the way he's been driving since he's come back is just so relaxed, isn't it? Like, he just feels free. Well, he said it himself. He's driving like a man with nothing to lose. But mm. for a team that Haas has obviously been down the back the last couple of years, it's amazing a team that's fallen down from the midfield to the back has become more popular. Yeah. <laughs> Mostly because of the team principal, Gunter Steiner. Mm. Just asking everyone out in the crowd, how many people are here for the first time because of Drive to Survive? Put your hands up. Quite a few. Yes, quite a few. Not good, yeah. good, not for, good for a podcast. Great That's visual okay. cue for a podcast. Not good for a podcast. People know what they're looking at here. And I'm noting as well, there's a sign here wishing Gunter a happy birthday with there's references a... I probably... I don't know about that should go on the podcast either. <laughs> Well, we all know what kind of... We have to warn Gunter not to swear, I suppose, when he turns up. I'm sure he'll, he'll know. He's a professional. I think, I think we probably need to sing happy birthday to him, don't we? Oh, maybe? do you want to do that? Yeah, do you want let's to do that. that. Yeah, yes. When he when comes he, on, when let's, he walks let's, on, let's do that. Impromptu, please. Let's do to that. To work out your voices. The funniest part about it is, I don't. does he actually watch Drive to Survive yet? Well, no, he says he doesn't, doesn't like... <laughs> I mean, no one likes to watch themselves on TV, right? Like, it'd be weird. I can understand that. So I can, I can get that. But also, you know, he's... One of the main characters. It must be unusual for him after the last couple of years of Formula 1. Isn't it interesting, though, with that team now, we're going to have three races in America next yeah. year and with Las Vegas coming on. And as we were discussing the other day, after the last five Formula 1 races have been in the Middle East, in the desert, in the middle of the night, so yeah. it's either a 2 o'clock in the morning start or a 4 o'clock in the morning start, like how would you like your bad night to go? <laughs> the best thing about Las Vegas, a 10pm Saturday night race in Vegas, which will be... 5 p.m. here. Doesn't yes. that rule? <laughs> so good. That is the best thing. You don't even have to go. You might want to go to Vegas. It'd be way better if you stay here. It'll be a way better time zone. If you go to Vegas, you won't remember the race afterwards. Yeah, exactly. That's pretty yeah, much yeah, guaranteed. Yes. So but uh, yeah, it'll that. be what? Here, Japan and Las Vegas will be the only three races in daylight. Yeah, it's becoming an increasingly good time to be a Formula 1 fan. This race, isn't it? <laughs> Got Miami coming up too, obviously. That's going to be... Yeah, don't talk about that time zone, though. Oh, <laughs> what is that going to be? Don't, don't talk about that. Okay, good. Let's not talk about that. But... Um, <laughs> It's just so interesting that for so many years, Formula One tried to get a foothold in America. Mm. We have a pandemic. Yeah. We have an American team that a lot of people kind of ignore for a while. And all of a sudden, we've got three races. And, I mean, is there going to be more? Where else could we go? Could the West Coast sustain a race, maybe? Well, I mean, Vegas is pretty close, I guess. But there's always talk of a fourth race. Everyone wants to go to New York, I guess. They tried that once. That would be pretty cool, wouldn't it? But... Mm. I do think in, and look, the US is a huge market. It's great to see it's going off. Anyone who saw pictures of the US Grand Prix last year would know the crowd was huge. 
But the same effect is happening here in Australia. I mean, you only have to look around the yep. people here. The number of people here on a Friday when you should all be at work is incredible. And that, that is the same effect we saw in the US last year. There is growth in Formula 1. There are a lot of new fans we've just seen. A lot of old fans potentially coming back to the sport as well because it's so competitive. It's just a good, it's a good time to be a fan of Formula 1. You should all be at work. Yeah, you should be. What are you doing here? <laughs> what are we doing here? <laughs> Not working, that's for sure. No, that's very true. But look, the American effect, what will be really interesting from here is how soon until we get an American driver. I think that's the last frontier, isn't it, really? And there's plenty of good young guys in IndyCar at the moment. Obviously, Colton Hurd would be a mm. chance to come through. But isn't it interesting? Roman Grosjean, former Haas driver, mm. now be, may, he may be more popular now because of <laughs> what happened to him in his last Formula One race and then obviously now racing in IndyCar. I did read somewhere the other day his merchandise is out selling everybody's over there. Really? For a French driver in an American <laughs> Open Wheel Series. So it is crazy, isn't it? The He's American got a thing. cool logo with the Phoenix. The he does. Motif. It's very good. And it is impressive, isn't it? We've seen occasionally Formula 1 drivers cross over there and do really well. We've also seen Scott McLaughlin, obviously, recently cross over to IndyCar and do quite well, which is really exciting to see. It's that cross-pollination of drivers. It is really good, and it does feel like America is, is sort of having a moment there as well now. Having a moment. About time, yeah. too. Look, coming up on the other side of this break, Gunter Steiner is going to join us, so stick around. <laughs> time for a bit of F1 trivia. Did you know the Australian Grand Prix was once held twice in a row and that the same driver won both races? In 1995, the Australian Grand Prix was the final race of the season. It was held in Adelaide. In 1996, the Australian Grand Prix was the first race of the season, held right here in Melbourne. The same driver won both. It was Damon Hill. So Damon Hill won two consecutive Australian Grand Prix, back to back, just 119 days apart. I mentioned Damon Hill because he's one of the hosts of the F1 Nation podcast, which you should definitely check out. It's hosted by Damon with F1 reporters Tom Clarkson and Natalie Pinkham. They chat to a whole host of F1 guests from around the world, drivers, team bosses and paddock insiders. The next episode will be out this Tuesday. They'll have the last word on what we hope will be a thrilling Australian Grand Prix here at Albert Park. Search for F1 Nation on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all major podcast apps or F1's YouTube channel. If you're listening to us here on In The Fast Lane, you obviously love F1 and have a great taste in podcasts. Have you heard F1 Beyond The Grid? It's the podcast where you'll truly get to know the biggest names in F1. It's hosted by F1 journalist Tom Clarkson. Recent guests include 1992 world champion Nigel Mansell, Susie Wolf, and Ferrari's Carlos Sainz. Every week on F1 Beyond the Grid, a superstar driver, big boss or brilliant brain from the world of F1 opens up about the highs and lows of their racing careers and their lives off track. You'll hear stories you've never heard before and insight you won't hear anywhere else. There are more than 150 episodes in the back catalogue. In-depth interviews with Daniel Ricciardo, Lando Norris, Mark Webber, Sebastian Vettel, Kimi Raikkonen, Lewis Hamilton and many more. Why not give it a listen right here at Albert Park in the gaps between sessions? It's also perfect for your journey to work, while out walking, or your flight home from the Australian Grand Prix. You can find F1 Beyond the Grid on Apple, Spotify, and all other major podcast apps. It's also available on F1's YouTube channel. So once you've finished listening to us, search for F1 Beyond the Grid. It might just become your second favourite Formula One podcast, after In the Fast Lane, of course. Check out In the Fast Lane, the official podcast of the Australian Grand Prix. Dedicated to Formula One and MotoGP, In the Fast Lane host Matt Clayton is joined by F1 journalist Michael Laminato and MotoGP race winner Chris Vermeulen to interview some of the biggest names in world motorsport and update you on all the latest F1 and MotoGP racing news and talking points. You can find In the Fast Lane each week on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. This is In The Fast Lane, the official podcast of the Australian Grand Prix, live from Albert Park, with Matt Clayton and Michael Laminato. We're back live at Albert Park. Gunderstein is just a couple of seconds away. Now, you remember what we agreed, right? Before he walks, as he walks in, he's probably hearing this now, we're probably spoiling the surprise, aren't we? But you all remember, you all remember as he walks in. FP2 as well, not too far away, only 30 minutes away when we'll get a bit of a clearer picture of exactly how this weekend is going to go. We do expect the Haas team, of course, to be a little bit higher up than they were in the bottom of the order in free practice one, which I think will be a, a pleasant 
result for, for a lot of people who have remembered uh, the Haas that did so well here uh, a couple of years ago. Of course, they scored on debut here at Albert Park and we're on track. And this is maybe a memory we won't bring up with Kunterstein, but we're on track for their best ever results uh, before literally the wheels did come off the car. But hopefully for a much better result this weekend with Gunter Steiner, Matt. Ladies and gentlemen, the man of the hour is ready for his podcast interview. The team principal of the Haas Formula One team, Gunter Steiner. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was flawless. Well that done, was everybody. That was great. Seem absolutely seamless. Completely unplanned. Too. Completely yeah. unplanned. <laughs> um, I never had this many people singing happy birthday for me. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the biggest birthday party of all time. You need yeah. to come here in April more often, go yeah. to but, uh, <laughs> Welcome. Thanks for rejoining us on the podcast. We obviously had you on last year from uh, Zoom, doing all the rest of the podcasts on Zoom. But uh, welcome back to Australia. And uh, you come here probably in a very, very different space as a team than perhaps you were expecting, because the first two races of the season have been pretty good. Yeah, the, uh, the first two races this year were pretty good. The last two years were not pretty good, you know, but uh, <laughs> uh, so it's, it's good to, uh, to, to be back. But, uh, you know, this morning was not fantastic for us. We are working on the car, but I uh, hope we're getting there again. So, but uh, yeah, no, we are all happy to be back here. I think uh, our team is happy, not only because of the performance, but being back in Australia. Everybody likes to come here, me inclusive, you know, so it's very good to be back here, you know. When we... <laughs> <laughs> you don't even have to say anything. I think I'll applaud you. It's pretty good. <laughs> when we spoke to you last year, you were bracing for a difficult year. You knew it was going to be a hard year last year. It was all about saving up, essentially, for 2022. And it seems great. Like, it seems like everything's worked out. You're pretty happy. The driver's pretty happy. Everything's good. How nervous was the off-season, though, before you got the car onto the track? Were you worried? Or was everything just absolutely cool? What should I say? Yeah, I knew this was coming. No, it wasn't as easy as this, no. No, you always worry because I knew our guys did a good job last year. You know, we focused on the new regulation car, uh, but you don't know what the other ones are doing. The difficulties there. Uh, yeah, I, I had no idea how good the other teams are developing. If, if we did a good job and the other did a super good job, we are still behind them, you know, as simple as this. So uh, obviously the testing then in Barcelona was not very easy. We had a lot of reliability issues, but uh, then when we got to Bahrain, the feeling was getting better, you know, so uh, still not knowing exactly where we were, but the feeling was uh, getting good. And the good thing was, even if we wouldn't be top of the midfield like we were the first two races, we knew we can score points and we can develop with the other people. So we are back, basically, you know. It's not like 21 when we knew from race one, we're going to be a last or second last, you know. So it, it was quite exciting, but uh, no... Uh, and we are happy now to be where we are at, uh, except this morning where we were not happy. <laughs> I do like how you're just very matter of fact of top of the midfield. That's a nice thing to be saying. But I wanted to take you back between those two tests that you just mentioned before, where you've taken your phone and I need to call Kevin Magnuson. That's a strange phone call to make, given that obviously it wasn't that long ago that he departed the team. We know why he's back, but tell us about making that phone call and what was Kevin's reaction like? So I'm sure he would have seen your name come up and gone, really? What's actually happening here? It was very strange. Uh, I saw Kevin in February because I went to the 24 hours of Daytona just, you know, to see some people. And the first guy I ran into it when I entered the, uh, the, the garage area there was Kevin, you know. So we had a 20 minute chat just as friends because we had stayed always in touch. And then when, when what happened what happened that uh, uh, we, we let Nikita go. I was speaking with Gene Haas on the telephone. I made a list of uh, uh, who is available, the drivers, it's a super license. And then he came up, hey, uh, what do you think about Kevin? Yeah, a little bit. I said, I, I know that he has got a contract in WC with Peugeot and he's driving in the States with Chip Ganassi. I said, uh, do, do you think he can get out? I said, I have no idea, but I can ask him. I said, just give me five minutes. I put Gene down and phone Kevin up and uh, Kevin answered and I said, hey, Kevin, obviously the nice it is, how are you doing, you know, and uh, uh, 
Okay, and then he said, uh, would you be interested to drive for us again? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, then. All right, yeah, that was it, you know. Phone Gene back and said, oh, he's available. Okay, got it done, you know. It, it sounds very complex how these things happen. It was very easy. And then on the contract, we had only a few days to do the contract because obviously we, we need to get him testing. So he had to uh, tell Peugeot or ask Peugeot, not tell them because he had to ask, obviously, that that, that was the only hurdle in, uh, in the way. So said, Kevin, to make it easy, just we take the old contract and we just change the date and we are good. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so that, that is how it worked. Pretty simple. It sounds so easy to be a team principal. But <laughs> Anybody can do it, as you can see, you know. So, so. I want to talk a bit about Mick Schumacher. There are a lot of Ferrari caps out here. The Schumacher name is pretty enormous in Australia, as it is realistically everywhere. His second season now, we know historically his second season in any category is particularly strong. And we saw him start to get stronger towards the end of last year as well. What's his development looking like and what are your expectations of him this year? Obviously, when I, when I told uh, Mick that Kevin was coming, he was uh, happy. He said, no, that's good for me because I can learn a lot. I've got a reference and uh, for the team, it's, it was also good. So uh, the first two races, I think now with having a teammate, which is pretty good. Kevin's a pretty good driver. You know, he sees now where he has to go. But I think even if in the moment he's behind, that should give him the incentive to aim to get there. And he has got the help because he can look at Kevin's data uh, GPS data, he can find out what the car is doing and learn from it, you know. And uh, that is, I think, what he does. I mean, uh, we, we need to give him a little bit of time to make the next step up uh, in Formula One. Uh, but I'm confident uh, that uh, I would say in five to six more races, uh, he will get a lot closer to Kevin than he's now. Gunter, Drive to Survive. I'm assuming you've heard of it. <laughs> yeah, I heard of it. I didn't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> What do you make of all of this? Because you don't get into Formula One as a team principal to expect this. And now you've become someone who is social media fodder. You're probably the most popular team principal in the sport. And you still haven't watched it? No, I didn't watch any of it. Honestly, honestly, you know, I don't want to watch myself. No, I, I think what, uh, what Drive to Survive has done for Formula One is, uh, is amazing. You know, I never thought about it. And uh, uh, when we filmed the first uh, season, when it came out, I didn't watch it and everybody People phoned me up and telling me, well, I, I didn't know what was happening, you know, so uh, it was completely, and then they said, what that was it? I'm not going to watch it, because if I watch myself, then I maybe change, and I didn't want to really change for it, you know, because I'm not an actor, you know, I just do my job, and if people like what I do, so it be, you know, and uh, I enjoy doing my job, and if people are entertained by it, even better, you know, so I keep on doing what I'm doing, I'm not going to change. Haas is obviously Formula One's only American team. It is the American representative, I suppose, in Formula One. When the team debuted, though, F1 in America was not in the happiest place, was doing all right. It was not massive. Now it seems like it's absolutely huge. How have you seen the support for, for Haas and obviously F1 in America as well change over the last few years? And I guess the second part of that question, in Miami, I think they're planning on doing a team principal's parade lap on the back of a, a truck around wow. the circuit. How does that make you feel? That was a lot of questions. Yeah, uh, so, so, so uh, I, I think the biggest uh, uh, influence of uh, America to change was the Netflix series. A lot of people got interested. Then, obviously, when I'm there, uh, I live in the States. So uh, I, 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 you see it that now people recognize you. And I think people just started to watch it really. And America, as we all know, if it picks up, it can be huge. And now having three races next year, two races this year, three races next year, Will, will increase the following, you know, which I think it's very good because it, it, it is a very uh, big market. You know, there's a lot of people and they can get very, we can get a lot of funds there, which is good for, for, for Formula One. Uh, going to, uh, I heard about this. I was not told officially about this truck thing in Miami. I, I heard about it, that we should call it a truck. I, I think some people push each other off there, you know, so we need to be careful. <laughs> we need to make sure that, that it's high defenses are high on the side of the truck, you know, but... If they want to do it, I'm fine to do it. Uh, I, I don't know if the people like like us, ten old man going around the racetrack in the back of a truck. I don't know how interesting that is, but hey, uh, you never know. Practice your waving, Gunter. You just have to practice your waving. But look, we know you've got FP2 coming up. It's been fantastic. You've been able to spend some time with us this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Gunter Steiner. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Enjoy the weekend. Thank you.
So that's where we're going to wrap up in the fast lane live at the Australian Grand Prix on Friday. Coming up on Saturday from 2.30 to 3.30 p.m., we'll be joined up here on stage by a number of special guests as we build up to the all-important qualifying session, which will set the grid for Sunday's race. Until then, I'm Matt Clayton. Thanks for listening, and join us next time for another lap in the fast lane.